All right, everybody, welcome to tonight's virtual educator workshop. <clears throat> I'm Becca Plum, AVAM's Director of Education. I also have my colleague Mavet Rosas here running our running our Zoom. Um, our, she's our visitor experience coordinator. Thank you so much for joining us um, this evening. This meeting, somebody just asked, this meeting is being recorded. It will be on our um, YouTube channel after the session. Um, so we're so excited you're here tonight. Maybe some of you in our, in your pajamas, that was our dress code. Um, or you're probably just in your, in your cozies, like we always are. Um, so this evening, we hope that you will get inspired by some works featured in AVAM's newest exhibition, The Science and Mystery of Sleep that just opened in October and artwork by Esther Krinitz. Um, who, if you don't know about her, she, um, as a young girl survived the Holocaust, then later in life stitched her stories into cloth pictures, many depicting her dreams and premonitions. And her work is featured in the museum and is on display now in Esther and the Dream of One Loving Human Family. Um, we think sleep is a really timely topic during this time, during a worldwide pandemic, you know, we're all experiencing this stressful time and we're collectively um, maybe not sleeping well or having crazy dreams, or maybe we just wanna fall asleep and wake up <laughs> when the pandemic is over. Um, but what we don't realize always is that sleep is so vital to our health and well-being, um, and that our dreams can communicate our, to us premonitions, our visions, and even our nightmares probably mean something to us. Um, we're so excited tonight to partner once again with Art and Remembrance. We have Bernice Steinhardt, who is the daughter of Esther Krinitz, and we have Claire Tesh, who's also from Art and Remembrance. So we will get to them um, in a little while. Um, so tonight, we're first going to explore the sleep exhibition and look at three artists' works. Then we're going to move to the work of Esther Krinitz and end with our hands-on workshop, Remembrance Boxes. And this is a workshop that you can modify to use in your classroom with your students. Um, later in the program, we're also going to talk about a virtual coffee shop, um, which is going to be a day in time in December when we can meet virtually again um, and show off our finished remembrance boxes and talk about our art making process if we want. Um, just a few housekeeping reminders. Please use the chat box to ask us questions during the program. Um, we love to hear what you're inspired by and the connections that you're making um, during the program. Also, Mavet just posted in the chat, uh, we have a collaborative Google document that has all the links to all the resources and articles we're gonna mention tonight. So you can just open that up on your computer and have that to reference later so you don't have to keep copying all the links down. Um, Let's see what else. Oh, we are recording the session. As I said, it'll be on AVAM's YouTube channel. So to get us started, I want to introduce AVAM's founder, director, and principal curator of The Sleep Show, uh, Rebecca Hofberger. Thanks for joining us, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Becca, for all you do. Uh, I just want to begin with this. Rudolf Steiner said, education is essentially love for man. So a very huge, warm, visionary welcome to America's front line of lovers and dreamers, AKA teachers, mm -hmm. and thank each of you for your creativity and your loving care in the high art of teaching, of being educators. So our subject at hand tonight is the unique and varied roles that dreams play in our lives, how they influence and color our actions and our perceptions. Biblically, great credence is played uh, or is placed in the relevatory aspects of dreams, particularly in the story of Joseph, who betrayed by his own brothers, becomes a slave in Egypt, who then rises so improbably to the next to only to the Pharaoh in high position in his foreign land. And, and it's all due to his fabulous intuitive gift 
of interpreting the dreams of Pharaoh and of other people. Uh, so Joseph's gift results in saving both his Jewish people and the Egyptians by forecasting seven years of harvest plenty that would be followed by seven years of drought and total crop failure, enabling Pharaoh to adequately storehouse and prepare for those bad times. So I curated our new science and mystery of sleep exhibition for 10,000 good reasons, but primarily because we humans spend one third of our lives sleeping and only in the last decade or so has research been begun to penetrate all the nuances of the four stages of our our sleep life. And I used to kind of resent uh, sleep in a way because there's always so much to do. And perhaps you were like that too, but I've made friends with sleep now. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of that is because of its impact on our mind, our emotions, our body, and our well being. Did you know that during REM, rapid eye movement sleep, uh, that our, our body, while we're dreaming, is also the greatest part of the 24 hour cycle is synthesizing protein in our body. So it's all these complex and very essential things going on. Um, but this dream state and even the state- I'm on dear, I've got the headphones. Oh, oh. Uh, called the hypnagogic state between waking and sleep has long been mined by famous inventors and people like Mary Shelley who dreamed up Frankenstein totally from a dream, uh, you know, just uh, composers, Beethoven, Da Vinci, etc. cetera. Uh, so tonight, um, it, you are going to be so blessed by one of my favorite people on this earth, hearing from Esther Critis's daughter, Bernice, who will illumine the, the role that dreams played in her mother's survival uh, and uh, just the great role that intuitive genius plays uh, for so many people and in melorating our world. So I have a few questions for you out there as teachers. Did you ever dream an answer to a problem or awake with like the language you wanted to remember because it was so perfect. And if you don't write it down right away, often it'll just disappear mm -hmm. uh, or some inspirational idea or like our Esther, do you think you were ever warned of a danger in a dream? Or did you ever have a dream that seemed improbable come true? And then did you ever feel that someone as with Esther came to you that you loved uh, or knew in this life who had passed on? Did you ever feel someone visited you? Mm -hmm. So we do look forward to the bevy of your dream stories embodied in the inventiveness of your work on your dream uh, boxes and the stories that will go with them. But this is my wish for you. May all your sweetest dreams come true and may the inspiration from your dream and sleep life renew your body, but also your spirits. Thank you so much, Bernice. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Rebecca, um, for being with us today. Um, let's see, Mavette, we can get our slideshow going. We're going to first start um, with some works, showing some works from our newest exhibition, um, The Science and Mystery of Sleep. Um, in this exhibition, our visionary artists have been inspired by their dreams, their nightmares, their fears, and their faith to transform their bedrooms into work of, works of art um, and creatively express their subconscious thoughts. These artists have used their bedroom as their artwork, blurring the lines between real life and sleep. Um, an important aspect of AVAM's exhibits are the curated quotes that accompany the artwork. Um, so I bet if you wanna to go to our first slide. <laughs> um, so this is our first quote, which is the mantra of the first artist we're gonna look at. Um, if we all hold hands, we can't fight. And this was kind of the motto of Sam the, Sam the Dot Man McMillan. Um, and he, he dreamed of a better world where everyone would get along um, regardless of our differences. And I think, you know, we can all agree that that's a wonderful dream to have. Hmm. 
So this is a picture of Sam McMillan's uh, bedroom set that's featured in the exhibition. Um, so Sam the Dot Man got his nickname, obviously, you can see why, um, after he began, began embellishing everything in his life with his signature dot pattern. Um, like many of AVAM's visionary artists, Sam's artwork could not be contained by canvas or paper. And he just dotted everything he could get his hands on, including his bedroom set. You know, he has his nightstand. He painted on canvas sometimes, but on birdhouses, um, all kinds of things. He, Sam lived in Winston-Salem, North Carolina for most of his life and worked as a handyman and a house painter. Um, he began to paint around his 60th birthday and soon adorned everything with polka dots and often painted his signature message, if we hold hands, we can't fight. Um, he expressed his dreams of, you know, hope and peace in his artwork, in his happy artwork. Um, Sam passed away in 2018. Um, we do have a lesson inspired by Sam the Dot Man's beautiful artwork um, where we Hope students will be inspired to create their ideal bedroom, um, bedazzle their own space and create, you know, their work, their own personal world in their bedroom, um, as Sam did in his whole world. Next. Oh, here's a picture of Sam the dot man. I just love this picture because he's dotted his blazer and his hat. Um, let's see, do you want to go to the next one? Oh, and this is another picture of his drawers. Oh, interesting. Um, so here are some other quotes. And Rebecca, do you want to talk about these quotes that you picked? These? Yes, these are, are um, Talmudic quotes that are usually book ended. And we in the exhibition actually did book end them. If you can, uh, this one is actually the second part of the quote, it's sleep is one sixtieth of prophecy. But the first quote is really sleep is one sixtieth of death. And do you have that from uh, the, the image from Alex Gray um, with showing what his painting called dying looks like? Mm, uh, I don't have that one in here, um, but I have the Alessandro painting. Okay, so we'll go to the second one. Mm -hmm. uh, dreams are one sixtieth of prophecy. And uh, this is a young man in Italy who is totally self-taught, but I just really love this uh, work of art. If we can go to it, the, the little sleeping figure, um, a, a white figure with uh, these two levels of kind of spirits watching over him. If you could go to that. Oh yeah, Mavette, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. Yeah, and what's so funny, when we hung this picture, uh, you can see the second large heads, a uh, second row of kind of, you know, uh, heavenly figures looking down on him uh, asleep or the sleeper. Uh, I don't know if it's a, a man or a woman, but what's interesting is when you come directly in, and stand in front of the painting, the large heads totally disappear. I don't know how it, it happened, but the light is such where they disappear and you just see the little inner row of people looking at this figure. Right, I love this painting because um, it kind of pulls you in to see what's happening, but it's definitely like, a scary, you know, scary figures in there. And um, I read some articles about Alessandro and he says that he was, he wishes to transform his nightmares into beauty. So he's painting his nightmares. Um, and there was a great quote by him that I found and it says, I think that the mind is not a monolithic structure, rather it is a multitude. These presences in our dreams are signs of something bigger and I try to understand their message. So I think that's interesting in his painting. Okay, let me go to the next one. <laughs> and Rebecca, you chose this quote um, to go with our next artist. Um, what did you like about this one? Um, I'm very nostalgic. I happen to have been blessed with wonderful parents, but even at my age, I'm, I'm 68 years old, you know, like being able to go back to the room where I grew up, if we're lucky enough that that still exists, uh, was such a comfort. And so when this rock star, Robert Smith from The Cure said, I still frequent my parents' house. I go there to escape back to the bedroom that I grew up in, just to sit there and feel small. 
Uh, and I thought it was something that, that everyone could, uh, could relate to. And it's in the intimacy of, of the artist, um, Adrian Kellard, mm -hmm. who was uh, one of the early people to, um, to have AIDS when no one knew how it was transmitted. And so he was very devoutly Catholic and he really wanted to go there for his strength and he was not welcomed because people were so worried about how AIDS was transmitted. So he transformed his small New York apartment into the most absolutely beautiful kind of sacred shrine and a comfort, a place of comfort for him. And it's, it's stunningly beautiful. With that, you can go to the next slide. Yeah, so here's one of the pieces um, that Adrian Keller created. And this is actually supposed to be a headboard. Um, and we can, yeah, here's his headboard. Um, so like Rebecca said, he um, was shunned by his church community and decided to turn his whole apartment into his own church. Um, so a lot of his pieces feature religious icons. And he often uses some of these same symbols over and over the, the eyeballs, the flowers with faces, and then there's a sacred heart that's right in the middle. Um, oh, you wanna go to the next one, Mavet? So this is a photo that we got from um, his roommate, Regina, who loaned and gave most of the work for the exhibit. And so um, this is a picture of Adrian sitting on a, a small bench in his bedroom and he would carve the plywood with carving tools um, and then he would, the, sorry, the artist's name is Adrian Kellard. Um, and so he would carve with his carving tools and then paint with beautiful colored paint that he had. And then the final step would be to use a brayer with black ink to roll on top of the carving. And so that creates that really high contrast in his work. So do you want to go to the next one? This is another piece in the exhibition and this is his calendar um, featuring St. Francis. And so a lot of his work was functional and became a part of his apartment. Um, so not only just creating work because he wanted to, but it was, use, it was useful. Um, do you wanna keep one more? Um, <laughs> I love this picture. Um, so this this picture is of Adrian Kellard's roommate, Regina, again. And these shutters are featured in the exhibit, um, but she just wanted to show us that he literally made the shutters um, to cover the window. So um, his artwork was functional. Um, so it just, everything in his life just seemed to blend together, his faith, um, his illness, his artwork all as one. Um, we do have a lesson plan inspired by Adrian's work that you can find in the collaborative Google document. Maybe Mavette, if you want to drop it in for anyone who um, wasn't here when we started. But we do have a collaborative Google document which has links to all of um, the resources and lessons that we're talking about tonight. Um, oh, and Adrian's lesson, it's on safe haven. So we're asking students to think about what makes a sacred space um, while also taking a closer look at the scientific history of AIDS because that is a part of his story as well. Okay. So oh, if you wanna stop the screen, share them a bit. Does anyone have any, any questions about the sleep show? You can also think about it and we can jump back later. Um, everyone, yes. Rebecca, everyone's sharing their location. We have a lot of uh, friends from Virginia, Baltimore, um, Ohio. Wow. Okay. <laughs> like we're not showing any of the little more risque from Washington DC uh, works, are we? <laughs> I did not have those in my in my slideshow. They might have to come to the museum to see the <laughs> see the incredible woman's uh, uh, you know. Uh, amazing uh, bedroom set, but I will use two of the quotes uh, that uh, we use in that room. Um, one, the one comes from comedian Phyllis Diller, and she said, never go to bed mad, stay up and fight, uh, which we <laughs> thought was, you know, good. And the other one comes from Eleanor Roosevelt, 
Eleanor Roosevelt in this room said, um, it has a different connotation to bed. She said, um, I, I was so flattered when a rose was named after me, but then I looked it up the description in the catalog and it said, no, uh, no good in bed, but fine up against the wall. <laughs> and so that's, we thought that was pretty brilliant for her time. So it, it had the same kind of, um, you know, risque nature as the wonderful artist. Right. I know we couldn't cover everything, but it's just like a little taste of what we have in our sleep show. You did an um, awesome job. I mean, there there must be 40 quotes in the show. So, I know. <laughs> um, so next we are gonna take a closer look at the work of Esther Krinitz, who I said before is featured in um, the exhibition on the second floor right now, Esther and the Dream of One Loving Human Family. Dreams were very significant um, to Esther during her life and we have the very best person here um, to tell Esther's story, and that is Bernie Steinhardt. So let's see. We need to pin Bernice. There we go. <laughs> All right. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here this evening and to be able to share something of my mother's art and story with you. Um, but first, I just want to thank all of you educators for your dedication to your students. It's inspiring, and we owe you an enormous debt. So thank you. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. <clears throat> now to tell you something about my mother and dreams. My mother was a great believer in the power and significance of dreams, and they played really, I would say, a vital part in her survival during the Holocaust. So I want to begin by telling you a bit about my mother through the pictures that she created. And then I'll come back to the role of, uh, of dreams in her life. So if we can go to the first picture. <clears throat> my mother grew up in a little village in Poland with her parents, her sisters, her older brother. Uh, she had three younger sisters. And although her family was poor, she remembered her childhood as a time of great happiness. She was surrounded by the love of her family. And the first two pictures she created were intended to show me and my sister what her home and her family looked like. Her home and her family were what she cared about the most in the world. This is the first picture you saw was my mother and her family in front of their house. There's my mother at the bottom of the hill carrying water up from the river. And in the next picture, um, she remembered swimming in that river with her brother and her sisters and the animals along the banks of the river. And you can see the farmers coming in from the fields. Uh, and it was a time, as I said, of great happiness and security for her, but everything changed. The war arrived in her village in September, 1939, just after the outbreak of the Second World War, when Esther was 12 years old. So in this picture, she remembers standing in front of her grandparents' house and watching as one of the early um, uh, groups of soldiers, Nazi soldiers, uh, came into the village and one of them dismounted from his horse and pulled her grandfather off the steps of his house and cut off his beard, which was the emblem of his Jewishness. And that was the day that the safety of home ended for, for her and her family and all the village. The Nazis allowed the Jews to remain in their homes over the next three years, but over time they made it more and more difficult to live there. The Jews were forbidden to own livestock. They couldn't own um, any uh, cows or chickens, the source of their of much of their food and their livelihoods were disrupted as well. But even worse, 
they were continually subjected to terror, which only increased as the occupation went on. This now is one morning in September, 1942. Um, so we're three years now into the occupation. And one morning my mother and her family were awakened at dawn by soldiers banging on the door of their house. They were ordered out of their house, still in their nightshirts and threatened at gunpoint while their neighbors looked on. Although they were dressed for sleep in this picture, this picture is not about a dream. This was a living nightmare, which was what much of their life was like during this period. So in the next picture, this is now a month later in October, 1942, the Jews were all ordered to leave their homes for good and report to a nearby train station. My mother, who was then 15, refused to go. She had the idea that she and her next youngest sister, Manya, would uh, go to work for a Polish farmer as they had done during the occupation. So she begged her father to think of someone they could go to. Uh, and he suggested his friend in another village named Stefan. So here they are saying goodbye, Esther and Manya are saying goodbye to their family, to their home, to their village, and everyone is crying. And this was the last time that they saw each other. This is now when they arrived at Stefan's house, their father's friend. When they got there, he embraced them and hid them in his attic for a couple of days. But on the third day, he told them they had to leave, that everyone in the village knew the girls had come to him and it wasn't safe to stay there. So they left in the pouring rain and walked until they came to the forest where they hid while drying their boots, which you can see here hanging in the trees. This was when my mother realized that to survive, they would have to disguise their identities. So she came up with new names and new stories for them as Polish Catholic farm girls who had been separated from their family and were looking for work. I just want to point out to you the, the genius of this picture. My mother was never trained as an artist. So everything she did was intuitive. She had been trained as a dressmaker so she could sew anything, but she'd never done anything artistic like this before. Here, she wanted to tell a story that took, that took place over several days. And so in this one image, she combines their arrival when Stefan embraces them, the attic where they're uh, actually stringing tobacco leaves, their departure from his house uh, into the pouring rain, walking down the muddy road. And then finally, when they arrive in the forest and the sun comes out and they're drying their boots. It was her genius to see that she could tell this whole story in a single image. So in the next picture, they, um, that night, after they left Stefan's house, when, when it was under cover of darkness, they went back to, oh, we're missing the picture of Jambina there. Under the cover of darkness, they went back to their own, their home village and they went to their next door neighbor's house, Jambina, to see what was going on. And, but when they got there, she turned them away and she warned them never to come back. So they had no choice but to flee into the fields. And here they spent the night in a pile of debris. You can just make out these two small faces peering out of this pile of debris. And now of course they had no home and they had no refuge. So they had no choice but to keep going. And they finally came to a village of called Grabovka, 
where people were willing to take them in without papers, and Esther and Manya each found work there as housekeepers. The first night they stayed in the village, Esther had a dream. She dreamed that her mother came to her in the house where she was actually staying and pulled her out and started running with her. And when she asked her mother why they were running, her mother said, because the sky is falling and when it reaches the ground, we will die. And in her dream, Esther looked behind her and saw pieces of black sky falling to the ground. This was actually the very first picture that my mother did when she returned to her memory pictures 10 years after she made those two first pictures of her home. And at this point, she wasn't thinking of the series of pictures that was yet to come. She ultimately made a series of 36 pictures, but she was only thinking at this point, she was only thinking about this dream and the next one that you'll see. In this second dream, Esther was in her grandfather's house. This is the same grandfather that you saw in that earlier picture, whose beard was cut off by the Nazi soldiers. And she had, she had this dream, <coughs> excuse me, after she had been living in Grabovka for a while. And although people there were very kind to her and she felt somewhat safe, Nazi soldiers were coming through the village all the time. And she worried also that someone from her own home village might turn up and recognize her. She worried that people in Grabovka would ask for papers. And she worried that Manya would speak in Yiddish in her sleep and give them away. So fear was a constant part of her life during this whole time. So in her dream, she turned to her beloved grandfather who had actually died earlier in the war from injuries after a fall. But knowing that he was dead, Esther had stood at a distance from him and she held her arms out to him. And as she wept, she begged him to help her. She said, you're close to God, please help me. And her grandfather, who is a very devout man, was very reassuring in the dream and told her, not to worry that one day she would cross the river. So we have these two incredibly powerful dreams. One with her mother that came with a warning and premonition of death and the other with comfort and reassurance from her grandfather. After Esther finished these two pictures, she went on to create the other parts of her survival story, but it's revealing that she chose to begin her memory pictures with these two dreams. All of her dreams for sure were intensely etched, but it was the two dreams that she brought forward first. My mother never explained why she began there, but I think it might've been necessary for her to approach her memories through the doorway of her dreams. In some sense, the two dream pictures opened her up to her fears and her hopes, the two emotions of her dreams that were ever present in her survival. And she experienced those emotions with her mother and with her grandfather, with their love for her guiding her way and giving her the confidence she needed to endure. Now, all her life, dreams were significant to my mother. Not only hers, but mine as well. As a child, I would share my dreams with my mother and she always listened with interest and belief. Some of my dreams turned out to be prophetic and my mother always thought I had a sixth sense. Maybe I did, I don't know. But if I did, it was because my mother could see the truth of the dreams that I shared with her. So I wanted to end with Esther's memory of her arrival 
in the United States. Not a dream picture in the same sense as the other two pictures, but it was still a dream picture because coming to America for Esther was actually a dream come true, something she had longed for for her whole life. From the time her grandmother told her when she was a little girl that she would go to America when she grew up where the streets were paved with gold and money grew on trees. In an even bigger sense, Esther's life became the American dream filled with opportunities and freedom. It was remarkable that she could wake up from the nightmare of the Holocaust and step into the dream of America. This is how Esther told and depicted her experiences. And this is what we hope that Esther's art and her story can convey to you and your students as well. Both the nightmare of life during war and the dream of America when she arrived here. So to guide you through and to guide you and your students through Esther's art and story, we've developed a number of very rich materials and lesson plans on a variety of themes. Um, I wanted to introduce you now to Claire Tesh, our educational consultant who's been working with Art and Remembrance to create what we believe is a really outstanding collection of resources for you to use and adapt. I've been so impressed working with Claire at how she's taken Esther's art and story and linked them to themes that are both historic and contemporary, both uh, documentary and artistic. So um, please, if you have questions, uh, you can, or comments. Yeah, we do have a question, Bernice. Um, how long did she take to create the work and at what point did she start in her life creating it? Well, I have to say, you know, I've done many presentations and uh, about my mother's work and this question about how long it took her to do her work is the most frequently asked wow. question. Top question. <laughs> it's, it's a great question. She did 36 pictures over roughly a 10 year period. And the time she spent on each one varied by the complexity of the picture. Um, but on average, if you just average it out, it took her on average three to four months to complete each piece. They're very large. Yeah. Um, the largest one is about four feet by four feet. The smallest is maybe two feet by three feet, two feet by two feet. But they're, they're on a big scale and they fill the gallery um, uh, now at AVAM. And I want to put a plug in here. For those of you who haven't seen this exhibit in person, it is, Magnificent. I mean, the work itself is so beautiful, but Re Rebecca designed the gallery to uh, recreate the feeling of home that was so important to my mother. There's actually, I should have put this in the slide. I have it in mine. Oh, great. <laughs> Fantastic. That's why Claire and I are such a good team. Um, it's just uh, uh, an incredible recreation of uh, Esther's home. So please, uh, I hope you get to see it. Um, Bernice, one more question. Uh, what is the art medium? Would you consider it a quilt or a fabric picture or what do you call the medium she used? We've struggled with this for years. It's definitely not a quilt because there's no, there's no quilting right. um, that lifts it uh, off a of backing. Um, it, it is, we've called it fabric uh, embroidery and fabric collage and embroidery because that are the specific techniques she used. Um, I've called them tapestries. Technically, in a very technical sense, they're not woven, which is what tapestries usually are. On the other hand, the Bayeux tapestries were not woven either. They were also embroidered. So I feel if, 
You know, if they could call the Bayeux tapestries tapestries, I can call these tapestries if I want to. Esther didn't call them anything. I can tell you that they were her pictures. Yeah, and I think kind of jumping off of that, I think also um, a lot of educators um, have also been using story cloths because as they get students to, you know, with the narrative at the bottom of each of these, Esther's telling a story, not just through the images, but also through her own testimony, which is sewn in the bottom of almost every one of these pieces, um, except for the dreams, is that right, Bernice? There's uh, right, the dream pictures, at that point, she wasn't, she hadn't figured out that she was going to tell her story yet. So it wasn't until the next picture that she did that she started adding a caption to each of the pictures because she knew she was telling her story. Um, really quick, Bernice, this is an interesting question. Did Esther display these works in her home? No, I displayed them in my home. <laughs> <laughs> my mother, you know, my mother, I may have mentioned that the first two pictures she created, um, she made them for me and my sister so we could see what her home and her family looked like. And even the rest of the pictures, as she was creating something much more than just images of her childhood home, she just wanted them to give them to me and my sister so we could know what her, what her life had been like and we could see her family and we could understand her experiences. So after she finished each of her pictures, she had them stretched and framed and then she gave them to me. So I had them hanging on the walls of my house and um, people, my friends, my family would come over and just marvel at them, especially as they continue to accumulate. Yeah. And then one day I realized that I needed to get the pictures out into the world. They really needed a larger audience than the people who came to my house. Plus I had run out of wall space. I was gonna say they take up so much room in the museum. They probably took up your whole house. Wow. Yes, they did. <laughs> they did. Um, another question, um, did both Esther and Manya come to the United States and did they live near each other at all? Yeah, um, my aunt, um, both my mother and my aunt married their husbands in a, a DP camp, a displaced persons camp. And my parents um, came to the United States because my father had relatives in New York, but my aunt and uncle went first to Israel. But they did come to the United States eventually. My mother brought them um, to the United States and um, in 1960, and she found an apartment two doors away from ours. So yes, yeah, so after that, they did live near each other, really close to each other for a while. But my aunt is still living. This is the second most frequently asked question. Okay. Manya is still living. My mother died in 19, in, rather in 2001. But my aunt is still living in Dallas, where near her children and grandchildren. That's great. Um... So I think um, if any other questions come in, we can address those after Claire's. Um, oh, we have one that just came in. Um, what was it like living with this story on your walls as it evolved? Um, most installments, though beautiful and cheerful colors are disturbing memories. <clears throat> you know, that's a really good question. Not a frequently asked question, <laughs> um, but a really interesting one. I grew up hearing my mother's stories. So these stories, mm. I knew them my whole life. I mean, they weren't necessarily as intense in telling when she was um, talking to me as a child, but still I knew her stories. And so they were very familiar to me and they were, they were exciting and sad and happy. There were just so many 
feelings and emotions that they, that they brought up. And to me, they weren't disturbing. They were life. And it was all, um, and it was the soul connection, you know, to the family that I lost, that I lost too. And of course, you know, it was my mother's soul connection to them too, through her memories and through her stories. So um, I never thought of them as disturbing. And interestingly, my kids grew up with these pictures hanging on the walls of my house and they never found them disturbing either. They were grandma's memories and they were intensely close to her, but they were close to her, to her memories as well. Thank you for your reply, Bernice, to that. Yeah, question. I have the chat up so I can see. <laughs> I'm so it sounds like some people actually got to see the or have seen them in um, in the museum. So I'm I'm really glad of that. <laughs> and there's a slide um, of it that shows the um, how to stay in touch with art and remembrance. So make sure to um, look at that and follow on all the social media for updates and other events. And we'll also have time for more questions um, later um, as we're working in the, on the uh, boxes. And um, I'm gonna share my screen. I can't see this. Sorry, guys. I'm on my daughter's computer, so can can you see? Um, we can just see part of the screen. Oh, there we go. Here we go. Okay, so sorry. So here you'll see. Um, this is Art and Remembrance website. I am going to show you how to find some lesson plans. Um, I'm going to focus a bit on um, the dreams and some of the symbols and metaphors um, in the art of Esther um, Krinitz, but I want to show you where to find everything. So under education, you can go into the lesson plans. And here you have a menu. You see we have quite a, a few here. Everything's available in PDF and also on Satori, which I'm going to share what that is. It's an interactive um, platform that allows you to add on and modify and adapt for your own classroom. Um, let's go here to Esther in her own words and images. Now we have lessons for everything from math to social studies, um, art, um, and you can adapt. And what I wanna show you here is um, ways to show your students. Um, there's a 30 minute video about Esther. Um, you can go in and also find a lesson plan that I wanna show you the graphic organizers, all fillable PDFs that um, have the artwork um, right down here. So you can find um, within the artwork, um, perpetrators, um, witness, bystanders, heroes. Down here we have the Dawn Raid. As you see um, in the bottom, you have bystanders and the perpetrators. And this is a way to get students, um, you know, to maybe think about the vulnerability of, you know, the family out in their nightshirts. And right now, um, in this unprecedented time of COVID, you know, we're all kind of feeling a little bit off. Um, getting students to think about um, their own sleep hygiene and the importance of, you know, getting a good night's rest, um, maybe to get in touch with their own anxieties and to do this as an educator. I know we're all sleep deprived as well because uh, National Education Association says that teaching is one of the most sleep deprived um, occupations. 
um, and especially in these last eight months, um, a way to maybe get your students to start thinking about um, you know, the rest and dream and also introducing them to both the exhibit at American Visionary Art Museum and their lesson plans, as well as the art of Esther Nissenthal Krenitz. So we're gonna jump to the Satori, which I created just for you. Um, and this actually pops right open to the scene we were talking about. Um, this is a picture of the exhibit. Um, the house that was designed um, to be a replica of the childhood home of Esther. Um, it's really something to see and to walk through this exhibit. So if you get a chance, definitely go. You can also plan to have a virtual exhibit for your students by contacting AVAM. And if you're lucky enough, maybe um, Bernice will even give you a tour oh. Virtu virtually at this point. Yes. So let's go to the top of this. So the Satori is a vertical, um, almost like a timeline. And here, what I've done is I put all the different lessons that are related to um, art and remembrance, and we'll pop the AVAM lesson plans into here. It's a nice place to, um, you know, have your students go to, you can assign homework or have them work collaboratively. Um, and as I said, again, you can modify this to your needs. So one thing I want you to think about is maybe about a dream that's impacted you in some way. Um, maybe you have a reoccurring dream or maybe the details still resonate with you years after you've had it. Um, maybe in the comment box, just pop in there if you've had something like that. Um, here we also have ways to meet Esther. Um, we use in the social media, meet Esther, hashtag meet Esther. Um, there's, as I said before, a 30 minute documentary. There's also a, a viewer's guide and a scavenger hunt that you'll find. Um, here also we have from Black Sky Falling, um, a clip from the movie. We have um, annotated clips that go along with the dream, Black Sky Falling, or you can also go to an audio clip. Um, these um, clips and films are great for um, English language learners um, to um, you know, start the discussion. Um, also ELA, um, English Language Arts. Um, down here. We also have grandpa, I dreamt of grandfather and a close up here of his beard, which um, Bernice mentioned. And um, within the Satori's, you'll see there'll be um, forums and did you know and other ways to kind of dig deeper into the specific lessons. Here we have a uh, the dream realized, dream come true. Um, and you can have your students look at the image and find symbols, you know, which symbols in this image convey hope. Um, and if you want to go in the chat box and um, answer that maybe. Claire, I just had a question. Is the, well, is the dream box lesson in your Satori or are we just going to present that today? Um, I can pop it in. Um, I we can definitely pop it in after the fact. Um, okay. So this is definitely a fluid document, which I love about Satori's because we can um, add things right into it. Um, also some other classroom activities. I went over the graphic organizer. Um, this was something, this is a place for you to post your dream boxes. Um, while I was going through some of the existing lesson plans, we do have a timeline lesson plan, which looks at not just the events that were happening in Europe, um, events that were happening um, specifically in Poland, um, events that were happening to Esther and Mania and her family, but also if students are reading uh, Diary of Anne Frank or Night by Elie Vassell, um, you can also have an interactive timeline where students can look at 
what they're reading and see what's going on um, in that period of time in that era. And I went through um, the books and found some quotes and segments um, that exist in both of these um, nonfiction um, pieces that mention dreams or sleep. So this is also a way to engage students um, into thinking about um, you know, dreams and sleep and also symbols and, and maybe the metaphors that are connected to those dreams. Um, let's see. Also a great tool that we have is called the Fabric of Survival, an interactive gallery. I'm not gonna open it right now, but when you get a chance to go through it, this has every piece of art um, and the accompanying lesson plan. So it's a great way to kind of jump in and really get to learn more about Esther's work and all of the lesson plans that go along with it. Mm -hmm. Here, we're back to home. Um, I think um, we mentioned that, um, Rebecca mentioned, you know, our childhood has a big piece of our memories and our dreams are really kind of a whimsical puzzle. You know, as we're sleeping, um, kind of information is connecting and we wake up um, sometimes, you know, just feeling a little off of sorts, but home is a place that often, you know, can bring us comfort or discomfort. And we had um, what we called homework um, for Fabric of Survival. And you can peek into the Padlet that um, teachers actually posted on the summer. We had a workshop with teachers. And this is also um, possibly a lesson that you can do with your students um, in a very sensitive way um, to think about, you know, what makes them think about the comforts or maybe, as I said, you know, something that's not so comfortable about being home or what do you see outside of your window? Um, we're spending a lot of time at home. Um, so also here, escaping um, war and conflict. We have a series of lessons. Um, I'll be adding on to that um, more about uh, Syria and, um, in um, conjunction with the Immigrant Learning Center. They have a new um, lesson plans that go along with a graphic novel. And another way to kind of engage your students, I don't have the picture up yet, I'm gonna put it up, is like, look at that road, you know, this um, image and think about other roads or um, migration of humans that you've seen in contemporary times. And that's a way to kind of pull your students into this topic. Um, coming soon, we have a series of lessons specifically on symbolism, metaphors, and dreams. It's um, through the artistic lens of Esther Nissenthal Krinitz. And um, I put the objectives, all the essential questions and learning standards for all of you to get a, a sneak preview. This should be up um, very soon, and there'll be also a, a sutori that goes along with it that will house all the, the images. And in the meantime, you know, if you get a chance to peek through the virtual gallery, you can look for the following symbols. And maybe you saw some of this as um, Bernice was sharing with you, this color of the sky and the shape and color of the clouds and, you know, the birds. Um, there was vegetation and nature throughout. And nature was a, you know, something that protected Esther and her sister. You know, they they found themselves sleeping um, in the woods or sleeping in a haystack, um, looking at the different nature that conveys the seasons and timing of her story. Um, the roads, you'll see roads throughout her artwork, and um, you know, it kind of goes in that S shape throughout. And then visual metaphors and art, um, which is also um, under learning standards that you know help students to understand um, um, relationships and words and meaning. So you will find some strong um, divides, strong visual lines that go through some of Esther's artwork that kind of compare and contrast um, the good and the bad. Um, we will be putting the 
lesson plans um, for the workshop into this Sutori. Um, also, uh, uh, Bernice and I will be presenting at NCSS uh, December 6th, and we'll be back for what we are calling a um, coffee house, coffee shop, um, where you'll be able to come back with your finished boxes and we'll have a special lineup of speakers or presenters. Um, it'll just be an hour on December 9th, I believe from 7 to 8 p.m., is that correct? Yeah. And in the meantime, you know, feel free to post your box um, in progress or finished on the Padlet. Um, everything is gonna be here in this Sutori that is just for you. And what we do hope that you all do is to share the lessons and the story of Esther broadly, whether it's through social media or through you know, your colleagues and definitely, definitely keep in touch. We love hearing um, and we hope to hear from you throughout this workshop as well. If you have questions, um, we're all here to, to answer. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Claire, for that presentation um, of all the resources for the Esther Krenitz work. We're going to start with our hands-on portion of the workshop, our remembrance boxes. And we have the REM capitalized because, um, of course, we're talking about sleep um, and dreams. And so these boxes that we're going to work on, um, they can be a place to store your dreams, literally writing down your dreams and putting them in the box. Um, but it can also be used as a place to creatively express your thoughts and dreams that you've been experiencing, specifically during this pandemic time, this quarantine, this lockdown time. That's kind of what we were thinking in terms of what we're going to put on our box today. Because sometimes when you think like, about the dreams that you've had through your whole life that can be a little overwhelming. So Claire uh, wanted to just focus on this time. So um, just a few things to mention before we get started. Um, Everyone here um, is an artist. That's what we always say at the museum. So, you know, we don't want you to be self-conscious about what you're making because um, this box is really for you um, and you don't have to share it with others if you don't want to. But if you do want to, you can come back to our coffee house, coffee shop. Um, and of course your dreams are personal um, to you. And, you know, we thank you for putting them out there in the world. And I'll get to mine and Claire will get to hers in just a second. Um, there's also an article in the collaborative Google Doc that Claire um, found for us that is really helpful um, talking about examples of multicultural meanings behind dreams um, and sharing dreams and the different symbolism in your dream. So that article is in the collaborative Google document. Um, and then just a reminder that, you know, collecting dreams is extremely personal, um, but it can help us better understand um, the clues or subconscious mind. Um, but if you're working with students, you know, let them know that these are their personal representations um, and they can share what they feel comfortable sharing. Um, you can also modify and adapt this, adapt this activity, however, um, will best fit your students because I'm sure you have students of all different ages. Um, so, Mavette, if you just want to spotlight me and I can go over the different sections of our box. Let me see. Oh. Um, okay, great. So I'm going to show off my box while going over the prompts. Um, but basically, we, we're calling this a box, but box is just a loose term. I used like a recycling, a recycled seltzer box for mine. I think Claire had like a wooden box with a lid, but really you can use any um, kind of cubic vessel that will work. And we're decorating all the different size ba sides based on the prompts um, that Claire's created. So um, the first side that I did was on the idea of home. Um, and just thinking about, you know, I feel like we're, you know, we're in our homes 24 seven. So just thinking about what that means, what, what's the view from your window? Um, what does it feel like to be in your safe space? Um, so I just did a super literal sketch of my home, but then I also um, put a picture of my son because wherever he is, that's my home. Um, so that's the home section. Um, the next side is going to be um, your fears or your discomfort or your nightmares. Um, so this side, we want you to kind of think darker, think about some 
you know, some things that are bothering you in your, in your dreams or in your real life, really, I started writing down like some crazy nightmares I was having on this black paper and just kind of like folding them up on this side. I think Claire's is a little scarier than mine, but, um, since we talked last Claire, I have been just like having these weird dreams of people like ransacking my home, which I'm just wow. like, I don't know what that, and it's not, it doesn't even look like my home. It just is a place where I'm live. It's very strange. So mm. I'm like, I'm writing that down and putting it, <laughs> putting it on my box. Um, so yeah, this side is going to be a little darker. Um, let's see. Another side is, and again, we're going to put up these prompts um, when we're done. Um, another side is something good that's come from your quarantine or from your lockdown time. Um, we've been able to have time for maybe hobbies or cooking or catching up with old friends. Um, so for this side, I... Um, I'm a crocheter, but I'm not like super fast. And uh, at the in the springtime, I was able to finish like a huge crochet project that I'd literally been working on for four years. It's just one of those things you just set down and you're like, I'm gonna finish it one day. So um, I use my granny square to represent that, like getting things done. And I do have this little flower here because I did spend some more time in my garden over the summer. Um, and then the last side, is a dream for the future. So it's hard to kind of think past this time that we're in um, and what's gonna come next or what are our dreams, you know, for after this time. Um, one thing I was thinking about was just like the idea of celebration, celebrating different things happening in people's lives, babies, weddings, birthdays. And that's just like not something we can do in person. Um, and so, you know, that's just my dream is to be able to share these milestones with people again. Um, then step five we have as make your mark. So um, we wanted to add some dots to our box inspired by Sam, the dot man McMillan. So I did add some dots to the top. I also added um, some cards to the top to write dreams down on. So if you, you know, when you like wake up first thing, I mean, I only remember my dreams maybe for a few minutes and you can write them down and just stick them in your box and keep this next to your bed. Um, so that's my box. I didn't know if Claire, if we can spotlight Claire and she can show hers because hers is definitely a little different than mine. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> home, I had a head of a teddy bear that was given to me by a boyfriend a long time ago and it was decapitated in a move. And I just could never throw it out. And as I was cleaning out my junk drawer or drawers, I should say, this head actually found a place because it brings me like comfort and memories of, I called it kind of a, my Hemingway-esque years. Um, and so um, I also cleaned out my jewelry box. And so I dangled kind of chains and I felt it almost kind of ties all these fragments together of my crazy dreams. And because for me, dreams, um, you know, they, they, bring me comfort and, and sometimes fear. Um, and I process a lot through that, um, like grief or loss. And I portray that kind of on my nightmare side um, as, you know, just something that is also a recurring nightmare that I have about falling into a web of spiders. So I put that on the inside of my box to represent kind of that darkness and, I owned it too, because <laughs> that's one of the scariest things I can think of. But for some reason, after I put that in the box, I haven't had that recurring thought even. Um, this is kind of the, the happy-go-lucky side. This is the future. There's some travel and, uh, you know, I put little sunglasses on Minion that I couldn't throw out. I think it belongs to one of my daughters. And um, again, the jewelry box was raided, a necklace that was broken and just found a nice place on this dream box. Um, and this is, you know, just represents um, just kind of me, you know, teaching and, and hoping that, oh, thanks, I'm giving inspiration. I love that, it makes my heart happy. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I just had a lot of fun and my dots for step five and um, tribute of the dot man, I found these little, you know, Gems. jewels and I just put them all over the place. And um, 
just really fun and you know just do whatever you want with these boxes i also put in here um i don't know, fell down but you know one of these little rings for the phone sorry they give them out mm. every now and then i found it a really great way i hot glued it and it's a great way to keep my notes in here just clip them right on and i have been actually collecting my dreams the past i'd say two weeks now and i read through them yesterday and um i don't see any patterns yet but you know we'll see what happens when we come back to the coffee shop i love that i think we all should start collecting them and then yeah i like that noticing a pattern um that's great so Mavette, if you want to put the prompt back up, because I know we went over them really quickly. Um, so we now have time, you know, we basically have some work time. If you want to work on your um, dream box while you're with us, we would love to see what you're working on. Um, you can also unmute yourself if you have a question or you want to share with us during this time. Um, just to review, we are going to meet up again for um, coffee shop on Wednesday, December 9th from 7 to 8. So we can show off our boxes and what we've made. And also in our collaborative Google document, you'll find like a, a survey for this program just so we can get your feedback on um, what you thought. And so we can hopefully do more educator programs in the future. Um, so somebody asked, what is on the bottom? Is there anything on the bottom of your box, Claire? I didn't do anything on the bottom of mine. Um, no, there's nothing on the bottom. And I also didn't put anything on the back. But I think because after some of my dreams, I've been sketching. Okay. At some point, I might put some of those sketches on the outside if I feel comfortable. Got it. OK. And I like your idea of writing on those little strips. That's kind of fun. I might glue some of those on too. Yeah, I found this black black paper and I was like, that's kind of scary, but it was definitely just from like the early 2000s when we could buy like white pens and write on black paper. <laughs> but it's also kind of spooky. Let's see. Not sure if anyone's working on their boxes, eager to create my dream box. Thanks, Flo. Does anyone have any materials out that they want to share? Seeing down look. Um, let's see, someone asked, can we put items in the box? I mean, you can de definitely decorate the inside. Claire decorated the inside of her box and then keep it as like your dream storage box but you can put anything in there i also have a part of my box that was you know the good stuff about quarantine where i'm trying to manifest things so i've been putting on here like i would love to go back to japan so i put a little paper kimono on here and uh That's cool. you know just maybe uh you know, I'll add on to that because I think sometimes dreams may have that power to manifest. Absolutely. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Oh, hi, Judith. Hi, Judith. Hi. Yeah. So, um, so I, I do a lot of this like collage work and stuff. And on September 10th, we had a terrible flood in our basement in my Ooh. studio. Um, a lot of my antique books that I used for my collage were, were ruined. And um, my studio had to be dismantled and taken somewhere. It was taken somewhere by these people that do restoration work on basements. So I've been heart sick, like just bereft. And I've been quite sick. And then when I saw this workshop, you know, I have nothing here, nothing. But I went to Upcycle, which is a place in Alexandria where you recycle artwork. It's um, called Upcycle Creative Recycling Center. And they people bring things that they don't need, art things. And then other people go and they 
take them and then they use them in their classrooms or they, and I just got whatever inspired me. And I felt like this workshop was a gift to get me back to the land of the light because I, as I tell people, I do art because I can't not do art. So I'm just going to use what I have. You know, my studio is just filled with amazing, wonderful things that I've collected over a million years, but it's gone right now. Mm -hmm. And so, but I'm not gone. Right. And so I am so grateful for this opportunity. Um, I'm not good at remembering my dreams. I, you know, but I, I have just a few little things to use on this dream box and I'm really excited about, um, about getting back to my spirit again. So thank you all so much. Oh, thank you so much, Judith. We're glad we could provide that, that opportunity for you. And I do see some people commenting they're gonna sleep on it and think about their dream box, but maybe we can, we can see their box in a few weeks because I know it's not a instant process of creating. So on December 9th, we're gonna meet from seven to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And that information is also in the Google document. Thanks, Linda, for joining us. We can't wait to see your box. So I have something that was immediately available to me for to demonstrate my home. And yeah. this is my favorite um, bed coverings, my sheets and my um, <clears throat> pillow cases. And I just wore them out. 20 years ago, I love it so much, but luckily I saved all of the fabric and I started making masks out of this fabric. And it is just makes me think of home. And it is the perfect thing for my side number one. Yeah. Just sure. a little bit of fabric. So, so I'm so happy that I saved it. That's awesome. <laughs> that's great. What's the pattern on it? I can't tell. Sorry. It's um it's just a really dusty, rosy kind of, I don't know, kind of country chic kind of thing, you know, from 20 years ago. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Thanks, Virginia, for sharing. <laughs> anybody else working on anything? Or does anyone have anything else that yeah. they want to share that they're going to put on the box? Yeah. Hi all, thank you. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say I did bring my box and I'm thinking about what I want to do on all the sides. I may wait and do some of it, um, you know, sleep on it and do a, some over the next few days. But one of the things that struck me most being home so much during quarantine is we moved from one house to another. And for the first time in a long time, we're in a rental home that when I when we signed the lease just didn't feel like home it just didn't look like home so when you'd like sketched your home normally i'd think you know i have a vision of what my home is and i didn't really love the outside of the home that we're renting but we realized the other day like the three of us and our family sitting around the inside of it is exactly us because it has all of our things so all of our artwork on the wall and the three of us in it and just the warmth and coziness of it so I think like I hate our front door it's just really ugly maroon color and I don't even have any paper that's that maroon color but I think I'm going to make a door that's like that ugly maroon color that I don't like and then when you open it you'll be able to see like all the stuff that's inside that makes me think of home and that's just something that's really struck me lately so thank you all for doing this tonight it's been really really lovely and I'll be back with my box in a few weeks oh great thanks Anne. that sounds i love that and you're right when you move you have that feeling for a while like you know where am i how do i feel comfortable um but you're right your your family's in it and your your uh, your stuff is in there so <laughs> hopefully yeah. it'll feel more comfortable soon it will and we like bright colorful things and and bright artwork and so when you look around and look at the walls it doesn't look like our old place but it still feels like home inside totally 
Okay. Well, thank you all. Thank thank you. You. Go eat, I think, and I'll see you in a few weeks. <laughs> okay. Bye. We'll see you in December. Ooh. It looks like Star made a comment. She has magazines, or they have magazines, assorted recycled paper, bits and bobs. Oh, a round nut tin with a lid. Oh, that sounds, I love that idea. Mm -hmm. As the. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does anyone have any other questions about the um, exhibits? I like to imagine everyone is working. <laughs> um, I think we'll stay on for maybe just like five more minutes together and then um, we'll wrap up and we can rejoin on December 9th and see what folks are working on. Again, the museum is reopen um, Wednesday through Sunday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. We do have time ticketing, um, so you can go online, purchase your ticket and reserve your time to adhere to capacity guidelines. We also have some other uh, programs coming up, including virtual Sock Monkey Saturday and Sunday. So we should spread the word on that. Um, that's Saturday, December 5th and Sunday, December 6th, virtual. Oh, and Mavet posted, great, posted our website so you can see all our upcoming programs. And again, we do have virtual tours for um, schools and groups, any groups, and all workshops and guided tours virtual are free for Title I schools. So if you teach a Title I school, um, you should schedule some field trips with us, virtual field trips. And one little pro about being virtual is the whole school could come for a virtual tour, which we've been experiencing. So let us know. Oh, thanks so much, everybody. Just looking at our comments. <laughs> Bye, Virginia. Can I just jump in for a second? Yeah, sure, go ahead. I just want to say, um, well, again, I just want to thank you all for uh, being so dedicated, not only to spend time with your students in the in your virtual classroom, but then for joining us for this program, even at the end of the day. Um, so your dedication is really an inspiration to us. And I hope that you can really take some inspiration from Esther too, to bring to your classroom. And as I guess it was Becca said before, if you're interested in a tour for your class, or for your school, mm -hmm. and you don't even have to live nearby, mm -hmm. um, I'd be happy if I can, I'd be happy to join you for a tour through Esther's exhibit. So just okay. wanna reinforce that offer, I guess. That would be the best tour of the Esther work ever in existence. So hopefully somebody takes advantage of that. Yeah, I was about to say that'd be incredible. Our docents do an amazing, equally amazing job. Um, well, maybe, not, well, they do an amazing job. <laughs> um, but it would be wonderful. You definitely give it a whole different life um, and spirit to the story. So it'd truly be an honor. Thanks for those nice compliments. <laughs> um, to set up a tour, you can contact anybody, any of us uh, directly, Mavet or Becca. Um, I'll put my email in the chat.
Um, we have someone in our workshop today who worked on artwork that was featured in the parenting exhibition. Um, and she just said the dose and said, Avent are the best. <laughs> we do have a very, we have amazing they dose. Are. And our docents are doing virtual tours now and they are just as good virtually as they are in the gallery. All right, well, I think we're gonna sign off here in a few minutes. Um, keep an eye on that collaborative Google document to join us for our coffee shop on December 9th. Um, also, if you have a second to take the survey um, for this program, that would be appreciated. And we take your feedback very seriously, um, especially during this time. Um, so if there's no other questions, we'll go ahead and sign off. So thanks everyone so much for joining us and we hope to see you back in December. <laughs> All right, bye John. Thank you. Bye guys, thank you.